You're listening to the TV Obsessive channel, presented by tvobsessive.com. Hello and welcome back to the fourth episode of the TV Obsessive podcast. I'm Ryan Kirk, writer and contributor at tvobsessive.com. And I'm joined today by Cameron Cran, executive editor. And I understand, Cameron, you have never spent any time in a walk-in refrigerator. Is that true? Or do I have that wrong? I, I've never got locked into one. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So, I mean, I've got that going for me. <laughs> um, How, how's, it, how's it going today for you? Uh, it's, it's going pretty well. I was going to mention, I, mean, I did have a job. One time we were at the gas station, you, and then you had to walk in, and we fed it from the back. Ah, which is actually like a really cool setup to rotate stock, you know, but you'd, you'd walk in and you'd feed the things forward, but it was cold. So, you know, you'd like put a coat on to go in there. <laughs> well, that's a way we'll to circle back to that at the end of our episode. Yeah, to, uh, it's going pretty see, well. See some things. Yeah, good. Um, so, again, as per usual, we're going to run through at least a couple of news items that have got our attention here over the past week um general plan we'll chat a little bit about what we've been watching recently um we'll limit spoilers be spoiler free ish and you know we'll be spoiler free i guess as you say <laughs> in, the, in that first part and then in the latter um portion we'll be digging into something each week this week we're picking up on our coverage of the bear season two um so i'm looking forward to that if you didn't catch the last podcast we did we talked about the bear Season two, we, we did the first half. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on the second half today. Um, there's also a podcast out there about where season one and then we'll go on play, play catch up. Uh, so a lot, a lot of good stuff, I think, in the bear season two. I'm looking forward to talking to you um, about all that, Ryan. But so, um, and here we are. It's July 5th, 2023. What's in the news? What's uh, caught your eye this week? Yeah, I think we've got a few things we can, we can talk about today. Um, one of them is this... I don't know if I call it odd news, but I call it interesting news that HBO, which typically doesn't like to license its properties other other places, um, has a, entered into a co-exclusive deal with Netflix for some of their, you know, if you were watching HBO maybe 10, 15 years ago, some of their their best shows, you know, Band of Brothers and Six Feet Under, or True Blood is going to come out internationally, Insecure. Like, so these are some pretty big shows for, for HBO, and they're now going to be available on on Netflix, I don't know if you caught that news, sort of what you thought of this whole, this goes into this whole ball of sort of streaming new world that we've been talking about and sort of what, what, uh, what you make of all this? Yeah, well, it is interesting. It's almost a, like a little step back. It's not that new, right? Because what was new, I think, was the idea that places weren't going to do this anymore. Like when they launched HBO Max, because prior to that, let's focus on HBO. Prior to that, they had a deal with, um, with Amazon. I'm not sure how the lists compare, you know, but they were uh, Amazon Prime had included in it or whatever, whatever old HBO shows. Um, I guess the biggest thing I was curious about, given some of the other things that happened, that I looked into was it. it is going to be the case that they're going to also still be on Max. They're not pulling these things off of Max, which it's weird that you would have to look into that. But some of these other things, apparently, like Westworld, you know, they're saying, yeah, we're, we're done with that. And maybe you can watch it on, um, I don't even know, Pluto or yeah. something. And they just talk about it going fast in one way or another. So, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting in that I've always personally sort of had the thought that the market can't sustain this high number of streaming services. And um, I don't know if you agree, but it, it just, it seems to me, if you're like talking to people, you know, they'll pay for one, two, yeah. three, and that's about it. And then like, sometimes they'll rotate, you know, I think a yeah. lot of people will do this. Like, they'll, they'll say like, well, I signed up for Netflix for a couple of months and then I'll cancel it. And then I'll sign up for Hulu for a couple of months and then I'll cancel it, you know? So I don't know if the markets can sustain like seven, eight, whatever, whatever. So it, to me, it actually makes a lot of sense. This is yeah. you know, limited, uh, uh, limited set, perhaps, of things that HBO has done recently that I don't object to. Like, I think it probably makes sense. What do you think about all this? Yeah, so I, I sort of see it two ways. There's my consumer mindset of this, which is, you know, I think back to whatever, 10 years ago when 
I was th looking at how expensive cable was and thinking about canceling that and ended up doing that. And then I go and I add up all my bills now from my streamers. And I'm probably not probably I am paying more now for all of these streaming services than I did for you know, DirecTV or Dish Network back in the day. Right. And that's in addition to me having like, say, YouTube TV or Roku, when I'm just trying to get my, you know, my, my channels, just the, the things that I want to watch on a regular basis. So it, it, it's sort of this overwhelming amount of of options that we have. And then so sort of from the business side of it, yeah, how, how can they continue to sort of build this model where there's just more and more streaming services? It probably does make sense as we've seen some of them start to actually uh, logistically and legally consolidate. But some of them start to overlap as we're seeing with this deal with Netflix and HBO. Yeah, I mean, probably more bundling is in the future. I, I don't know, as you say, like I was pretty, pretty early on the cord cutting yeah. side, which I don't, I never like the term, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, one could have this feeling back in, say, 2010, 2011, where it's like, well, I've got Netflix. I watch some stuff on Hulu. Yeah. I'm fine, yeah. you know, because there, there are other things. And then maybe, you know, Amazon Prime starts creeping in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's, I don't know how many people actually, I see people complaining about this all the time, but how, what I wonder is how many people actually do pay for all of them, because it seems like a lot of people I know just just don't, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And that means that then they don't have um, all the services and they aren't, they aren't all getting those subscription dollars and they kind of undermined what they had going with the old cable model. Yeah, and I think they're still working all of this out. So we'll see. What I happens. I agree, and in, in our house, we ran through the you know the the maximum number of emails we had to get uh, show times. We could do you know the new Yellow Jacket season when it when it came out, right? Get our free trial. But uh, yeah, it just doesn't seem sustainable on on a couple of ends. So yeah, very very curious to see what happens in, in the future. But I just I just found that interesting with the for some of the 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 deals that are that are being made. But it's it, it's a new world out there. I think. Yeah, and I think it's still still developing, but um, yeah. So what what else is in the news this week? Well, I, I wanted to run a few things by you that I, I saw interesting this past week, and so that was the Television Critics Association, right? This is one of the early groups yeah, that right. puts out their their list of uh, of award uh, nominees for for shows in their upcoming uh, upcoming voting. And so sort of four key categories. I wanted to run some of those. Uh, run through some of those with you and sort of get your thoughts on so on maybe which one you think should win in each of these. Uh, the TCA announced uh, their nominees for each of program of the year, best drama, best comedy and best new show. And so I want to give you some names of things and are you up for sort of giving me some some thoughts or predictions on who would win? Yeah, I think this will be fun. Make a little bit of game of it. Yeah. You know? So you can list the things, and I'll tell you what I think should win, and maybe something about why, and then you can weigh in if you want to, and we'll move on to the next one. Basic yeah. Game. Yeah. Okay. All right. So all right, what's first up? You know, okay, award let's category with, nominees. Let's start with the new show. So a show that was new this year that okay. uh, would be obviously the first the first season, first time we've seen it, and so we've got a few. Uh, I think there are about eight, seven or eight nominees in each category. So your your options for new show. Are Andor on Disney Plus, Interview with a Vampire, Jury Duty, Mrs. Davis, Poker Face, Shrinking, The Bear, and The Last of Us. So these are shows from the last year. So the, we're actually talking about The Bear season one. So I was gonna ask, is the bear does the bear get to be on the list? Right. Because that's so, get, it's definitely the bear. Yeah. So the bear coming out after May 31st missed the deadline for all of the for this year. Okay. So, so they are now looping back in and catching the first season from last okay. July. So, uh, yeah, so just a weird kind of timing issue here. So yeah. but in terms of these awards, yes. the award would be for the bear season one up right. against all it, it's I, 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 I take the bear. I mean, I think the bear is is, is um kind of in my mind the bear is definitely top tier and um, i don't know what, what do you think about this yeah i i agree with you 100 percent um just to be and obviously we we love that show so much we wouldn't have spent all these <laughs> right. hours watching it and i think i told my wife i've counted up about more than six thousand words i wrote about it over the last couple of weeks so it's a it, i certainly agree with you there but if i was to just be contrarian for a minute 
I would uh, I would choose jury duty. Uh, I, you wrote a piece uh, on jury duty. Yeah, yeah I still watched it, so that would be. Yeah, that's it, always the problem. And maybe it's because it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. It is um, completely fresh idea and was quite refreshing in the point that it tried to make at the end. And I just found it to be this really good story of this of this everyday guy who um they ran through the ring in a lot of ways not to spoil anything and and uh i just really recommend people watch that i haven't had a chance to check it out it's on yeah. amazon freebie it's on freebie yeah and i really enjoyed your article on it. i mean i thought it was poignant just everything in it and now they released something with it's like commentary um did you watch this also or no i haven't seen that yet no yeah. i've seen some people friends it. but anyway okay so i maybe i'm cheating because the bear season two is so fresh in my mind yeah. and i managed to think oh what if it were just season one i'm still going to choose the bear um so yeah. the next category we'll allow some recency bias there okay comedy i'm going to give you some nominees for comedy um abbott elementary barry poker face reservation dogs shrinking the bear again the other two and what we do in the shadows those are your options. Well, I'm definitely going to choose Barry here. <laughs> um, I think, particularly with what it did in the in the final season, which is that what is that what's on, or is it season three? I don't know how I'm confused. I think it would be um, the the final season, but because it it came out before this arbitrary deadline that they set. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, the the bear, Barry. I mean, it really jumped up there. I mean, I never. When that show first came out, I thought, well, Bill Hader's funny. This will probably be pretty funny. I'll go ahead and watch it, you know. And I enjoyed it from the beginning, but I never imagined that by the time we got to the final season, um, I'd be seriously asking myself where it ranks in my list of best shows ever made. And I am. I was. I'm not I'm not saying it cracked the top five, but like I thought about it. Yeah. You know, I, I thought about where where it would fit is it in the top 10 maybe not even but like i found myself thinking about that and um i know shrinking's on here several times i'm just going to mention yeah I, I don't particularly i i tried that one and i um uh i quit i didn't i decided i didn't like it so that's not going to win any boards for me yeah. that's, anyway, that's funny I, you say that because i i have seen so much mixed review about and mixed commentary about that show some saying that it's excellent and some say that just not not for me jason, jason siegel and harrison ford together didn't didn't do it so anyway just found, yeah i found that interesting we're, we're two for two on the on that one showing up um so barry clearly is a it, the series is a comedy more than anything else did you think the last season was a comedy yes absolutely i mean and it's weird I, i've had this idea percolating for potentially writing an article right on this but it's very weird and i don't know if i'll do it i don't know yeah i don't know if i have the juice but i also don't know how to make the argument i don't know how to, i don't know how to like convince people that something is funny this seems like a very weird yeah thing yeah. to try to do but that would be the i think it's it's definitely in the wheelhouse of not just dark humor but mm -hmm. like black humor you know like um if i were to write about it i would i would start uh referencing all three of our and stuff like this so because um but but i think that there's it's interesting to me that some people seem to have enjoyed it without quite finding that humor which is probably a testament to the quality of the show but um i think it definitely is a comedy first you know and when i saw some people reading things about the social commentary of the way it ends and things like this like well what's the point of this and I, my, my my knee jerk reaction is well the point is it's hilarious <laughs> and then we can start talking about yeah. the social commentary the point's not yeah. the social commentary the point is it's very very funny but i guess maybe it didn't land to uh land as funny for a lot of people what about for you yeah on comedy um i i will say i i enjoyed beyond the, the bear i enjoyed uh, I, I love Barry. I, I think that's an absolutely fabulous choice. And probably again, if, if I had gone first, been my choice. I really liked Poker Face. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought for a show that intertwined with what it was trying to do and sort of combine that with sort of this episodic sort of serial nature of of you know these old school murder mysteries and and who done it stories. I, I thought that was really well done. Um, 
And I, I think that's coming back. And I, I'm really glad that it is. I, th- I thought it was a pretty good entry into the, some of the pretty heavy stuff we got we got last year. Yeah, well, definitely. And do you think do you think it's fair to to label as primarily a comedy? I mean, I guess this is somewhat arbitrary in terms of what we're putting things. Yeah, yeah, I, I I think so. You know, so much of this sort of is it comedy or drama is is often tied into how long the episodes are, and you know what's what's the uh, general general premise and. And yes, this was a, you know, that, that show was about a, uh, it's about murder mysteries. It's about criminals, people on the run. Um, but the, the, the characters are, are so <laughs> in, in some ways, so, so over the top. And so just, they, they, in each of the places that she goes, she's kind of in a different city, each episode, they represent those characters in a really funny way, I find. Um, you know, me being from Texas, there was an episode in Texas where they go to a barbecue joint, and I just you know, felt seen in a lot of ways at that at that episode. Yeah. Of, you know, some of the characterizations. So I, I really enjoy it. Cool. So all right, well, well next all category right. then. Next category, drama. So th- there'll be a lot of overlap in these next two drama and program of the year, but drama yeah. have Better Call Saul, Succession, Andor, Interview with a Vampire. The Good Fight, The Last of Us, White Lotus, and Yellow Jackets. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna slow play this one, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, which is which is gonna be amusing to me because I almost interrupted you to you know give the immediate answer, but I'll slow play it and say, first of all, I love Yellow Jackets. I got a little bit down on it towards the end of season two, if you will go read my articles, but it's like, I still love the show and I still want more of the show. I just, I don't know, I had some quibbles and disappointments, but um, that's not my choice. <laughs> um, the other maybe big caveat that might be worth making in terms of what I know about reactions in the world is that I'm I'm not a fan of Succession. It just it doesn't work for me. I know people say that it's really good, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if that is what you say or if it is what wins. But the winner, according to me, has to be Better Call Saul, which is perhaps in my mind the best show made in the last decade. <laughs> so, I think you may be surprised to hear this. If this last year did not include the final season Better Call Saul, I would have said Succession. But I, probably like you, thought that Better Call Saul final season yeah. was so tremendous. I, I, I don't see, even with, I, I think, how well done I thought Succession was, how much I loved Yellow Jackets. You know how much I like White Lotus and Last of Us, you know, having been devoted to those on, on the site for months on end. Um, that last season Better Call Saul, it gets my vote a hundred times out of a hundred. I just thought it was exceptional. Yeah, absolutely. And to plug, this isn't writing that either of us have done. Our dedicated uh, Better Call Saul um, writer is uh, Allison Loretta. Go go and read her um, recaps and analyses. That they are, I mean this absolutely genuinely in my mind, the best work on Better Call Saul on the internet. There you go. Yeah, check out the site, tvobsessive.com. Look at our, at our coverage of Better, Better Call Saul. Okay, program of the year, final category. Abbott Elementary and or Better Call Saul again, Poker Face, Succession, The Bear, Season 1, The Last of Us, The Other Two, and White Lotus. Yeah, well, I mean, so given what we were just saying, what I was just saying, it sort of has to be Better Call Saul again. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't I don't think I could switch it up. If we got in a different order, you know, you might you might have said like, well, we gave Better Call Saul performance of the year, so we'll try to switch it up in the yeah in the other category. But no, I, I think it's got to be Better Call Saul. What do you think? I think this would be a really tough fight if the Bear season two was up against Better Call Saul. Um, I think right. some, some of my thoughts on it later, but um, I would still pick. Yeah, I mean Bob Odenkirk, Bob Odenkirk all the way. Um, that that that's that's got my pick for oh, this man. last year's best best season. Oh God, Ray Seenhorn. Yeah, and some of those moments in the final season of Better Call Saul. Although I think, well, is it just like the second half of the last season that's in yeah, the here? Good question. S- still, even if that's the case, um, man, particularly given the the nature of what what these awards are, right? We're talking about um, critics awards, and so 
I mean, I just had to give all the props in the world to Better Call Saul in terms of the quality, not just of the acting, but the writing, the production, the directing, the editing. I mean, just just thoroughly, just a brilliant, brilliant show. So, yeah. Well, those are the categories. If you, yeah, that's that's the categories. And if you haven't uh, picked up on this, I think that the Better Call Saul would have our highest recommendation if you haven't gone through it. It, we, uh, it, it takes it takes a bit to get through some of the first seasons, but boy, does it pay off at the end. We um. You know, on the uh, on the side, this goes back to the two five wild days. We did the we've done the TV awards, and um, if anyone wants to go and find those things, you can probably find me year after year finding a way to either give an award to Better Call Saul <laughs> as the best show of the year, or as the thing I'm looking forward to most next year for like m- multiple years in a row because there were production delays. Or maybe twice giving the performance of, of, of the year um, award to Ray Seymour. So Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely uh, tremendous. Well, those are the two things I saw. What about you? I'm sorry, what was the question? Yeah, those, oh, well, those the, are the two things the I news. saw in the news. Anything yeah, you saw? What, what else was in the news? Well, I mentioned to you the, the um, layoffs at ESPN. You want to talk about that? I feel like my news items are always bummers. Well, no, I, I did just because... As someone who grew up watching ESPN and watched it with my dad and, you know, watched it in college and still catch it today, it just was a shock to see the names that were off, right? You see these, these back end people and writers there, they lay them off all all the time and not to, not to make light of those, but these were headline. This is like, this includes like Steve Young is on the list. Yeah. Yeah. All you know, favors, who, Todd McShay, their top draft, you know, one of top draft guys. Yeah, I was gonna ask who who stood out to you most. Yeah, Steve Young, um, Jeff Van Gundy, their Yo, former NBA head coach. Who is team. going to tell me they don't know what a flagrant foul is? <laughs> if they're now they right. Uh, I mean, this is just massive, massive cost cuts, right? To, it to is. you know, to get rid of some some people like this. There were huge n- names on that, and mm-hmm. I think it's just a result of you know, they've got so many big deals out there with these agreements and li- and licenses to show some of these leagues that, you know, with people cord cutting or whatever you want to call it, they just, they, they can't, can't afford all these folks anymore. Uh, I guess so. I, I feel like, I don't know if there's what all goes into it, but I, another thing I find myself thinking about recently as I've been watching ESPN a little bit more recently than I had been in the past couple of years is I do, I feel like the production value has ticked down a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm, am I right about this? Absolutely. Like, I, I started feeling like like they feel like they can get away with it not being as good or something. So I don't know. In my mind, it almost feeds into that. Like they are making almost cynical move. Like, yeah. well, people will still watch this even if it's not as good as it used to be or something yeah. like that. We're the place to go to for sports no matter what, no matter the quality of the production or the people in front of the camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's overly cynical. You know, they, they yeah. um, well besides but, the, yes, besides ESPN, what do you what are you watching these days? Um, so along similar lines, let's pick up here. I mentioned did you ever watch this uh game theory with Bobani Jones on HBO? I have never seen it. Now I understand it's not been on that long, but I've never seen it. Like I got canceled like yesterday. And <laughs> and I think so we're talking about sports and just to everyone who's like, hey, I thought this was a TV podcast. Sports are on TV and we're talking about it as TV. <laughs> we're talking about it as TV, right? Yeah. Um, but we're in kind of a sports desert um, this part of the year. And then particularly also um, the, the ESPN shows weren't airing because of the holiday weekend. You know, like sometimes I like turning on around the horn or something like that. And um, so I, I started watching this HBO show, Game Theory with Bobani Jones. And these are reruns. So it is maybe a little off because they're talking about things that were topical months ago. But they're also, the whole idea of the show is he's trying to also talk about these kind of broader social issues in relation to sports. Um, And uh, anyway, I really enjoyed it. But then I looked, I was kind of like trying to look into the show more. Yeah. um, And I was wondering if it's being affected by the writer's strike, which probably it would have been. But anyway, they canceled it. Mm. I still do recommend, I guess. And I hope <laughs> I hope that Bomani Jones lands on his feet. I always enjoy it. Yeah. Are you familiar yeah. with Bomani Jones? Yeah, i I did follow him um when he was at, at ESPN. He he is very, I, I think, thoughtful and critical and can tie uh what's going on in sports just to some very relevant social social commentary. Of course, that's what a lot of people complained about it. 
ESPN and it might be, you know, some of their, some of their issues, but I have always been a fan of his. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think HBO is just saying the ratings weren't high enough, which is fine, you know, yeah. whatever, whatever, but it lands on his feet. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, I checked out, uh, I have screeners for this. It comes out on Friday, the horror of Dolores Roach. Have you heard about this? So you mentioned this to me and I watched the trailer for it, having not known anything about it before. This looks quite good. I'm interested to see what you think about it. Um, I don't know that I love it. Okay. I mean, I haven't watched the whole thing. Um, I've watched, I think, like three episodes. And it's pretty good. It's based on a, it's based, one of these ones is based on a podcast. Um, okay. It, I think I think it's Gimlet again, which was also the ones who did the Homecoming um, podcast that turned into a show a few years ago. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, I probably I should finish it because my, my question is, does it have something more distinctive to it um yeah. from initial impression i think it's worth watching but it very much is kind of sweeney todd with empanadas interesting so, okay um if you know sweeney todd so maybe you don't know sweeney todd right like if you don't know sweeney todd then it's probably <laughs> different than if you do know sweeney todd because i find myself watching it thinking like well i like sweeney todd um, but is there going to be more of a twist to it than um this being basically Sweeney Todd in Washington Heights with empanadas, which is a, which is just like already a twist. So like maybe that maybe that's kind of be kind of you know going to be the whole deal. But um, yeah, it's interesting anyway. Yeah, well, you, I, I'm adding it to my list because I, I watched the trailer. The trailer makes it makes it seem at least very interesting. Um, and so I'll, I'll be. I'll be catching it when it comes out this weekend. Cool. What have you been watching uh, lately? So I am on the recommendation of you and and several others. I'm finally diving into the Righteous Gemstones. This has not been my thing over the past few years. I would say not been my thing because maybe Danny McBride has not been my thing the past few years, but I am a few episodes into the first season and I'm really loving it so far. I find the humor um, to be a combination of, of, dark and 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 screwball which i like i um as someone who grew up in a in a conservative church there are some real themes there that i find uh very very funny and interesting and i'm i'm gonna keep going and push through and try to catch up with where we are right now oh cool yeah i'd love to talk to you more about and particularly with the background that you're mentioning and the religious work i mean one of the things that's striking me in contrast to the other daniel mcbride shows Maybe this is unfair, but at very least with Righteous Gemstones, I feel like the show also weirdly has a lot of heart. Mm. Like there's something really kind of... So, yeah, maybe we'll have to talk about this more, but just <laughs> if we're just hitting it quickly, because I am up to speed. I'm watching the current season staring right now, which is, which is very good. But um, with where you are, you're still in the first season? Yeah, just a couple episodes in is all. Just, just okay. Quick spoiler-free question. Who is your favorite character so far? Oh boy! See, interestingly, Danny McBride is my favorite character. Yeah, Jesse. Yes, okay. yeah, <laughs> and, and maybe that's because the 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 plot. Not to give anything away, obviously, but the plot of the first couple is very much tied to him, who he is, what he's trying to hide. Uh, these these couple of of uh, uh, of secrets. There's just kind of a lot of different sides of him that you're seeing, and I, yeah. I, I'm I'm turning my turning around on him somewhat in these first few. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how I'd answer the question. I put you on the spot. Do you get to, to get to the mention of car pranks yet? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. I don't. Th- not Sorry, that I recall. I, I don't think it's all a spoiler. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, a ha- but anyway, it's like one of my favorite jokes in in season one. Um, but cool. Yeah, hoping to. Uh, we'll have to talk about that more. I think the Rise of Shem Sounds is, is good. really good and worth thinking about. So. I hope to fly through a bunch of them and and uh, get up to speed as quickly as I can. Cool, yeah. And did you notice all the titles? Did you get to the interlude yet? No, no. Okay. All right. No spoilers. Okay. okay. Nice. <laughs> I mean, it's like a structural form of spoiler. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, we'll, we'll talk we'll talk about that more moving forward uh, for sure. So um, well, should we get back to the bear? Yeah, why don't we take a little uh, break here just to reset things and then we will talk about the second half of season two of the bear.
Okay, we are back and ready to talk about episode six through ten of the Bear season two. Um, we spent a good amount of time last week talking about the first half and how it really set. We saw it set the stage for what the season obviously is going to be. We saw it set the stage for this idea of some of these departure episodes, but we really get hit hard in these first couple um, of of episodes six and seven. Um, here right at the beginning of this back half of the, of the season but just just in general we've now wrapped it up um, we can open it up to spoilers now we can sort of dive as deep as we want um, what are your thoughts here on this second half how it ended how this um, some of these powerhouse first couple of episodes really lended themselves to what the rest of the season looked like yeah when, like maybe first a stronger spoiler warning we might not yes a strong spoiler warning like we're going to tell you what we're going to talk about what happens in the bear season two and everything that exists in the bear is fair game you know so spoilers if you don't want spoilers from the second half of the second season of the bear uh turn off now i guess basically i, I don't like it but anyway um <laughs> yes right so i mean um yeah you're absolutely right so i'm like episode six fishes I like I like the short episode titles too. Yeah, like put them together. And then, so the feast of the you know, the seven fishes. Um, this is where we get Odenkirk, along with a lot of other right. recognizable mm-hmm. faces. And I don't know. Um, you may know better than I do. Did we know all these people were going to show up, or was I mean, like, was I not um, paying attention? To know that all these people are going to show up, or or were there surprises in here? See that, that that's the funny thing because I was I feel like paying attention, and there was a clear announcement about Odenkirk, and so yeah. we were speculating about who he might be. These other names that we've seen, Jamie Lee Curtis, John Mulaney, these other folks, I had no idea they were going to be in this in this episode or in this season at all. Same, yeah, I, I did not know. So I, I you know, okay. Um, but the, the cycle is so things you, you, you drop it all at once, and then all of a sudden, all the yeah. people know. And I've got <laughs> um, I've got people sharing gifs on my Twitter feed of you know Bernthal with a fork in his hand. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, so that episode um, was great. I think um, obviously, I I really struggled with it when we talked about this a little bit before with the. Um, you know, episode seven from last season, the handheld camera, and I struggle with this. And I actually took a couple of breaks in the first 15 yeah. minutes of this episode because I was just getting like too high on the anxiety spectrum. Um, as I sometimes tell people, you know, it may be realistic, but if I were in a room like that in real life, I would leave. <laughs> so I'm subjecting myself to it as a as a TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, but but really great and really all I the, all of the performances I thought were really great from the cameos, but particularly Jamie Lee Curtis. Do you do you agree? I, I do, and I don't know if you saw this. She she put an Instagram post out. I think after a week or so after the the, the season had been released, and in that post, she said something to the effect of "This was the role of a lifetime" because of just wow. how how. Um, not that it was, I, I think, close to home or or personal to her, but it was just something where she could play this role that really was supposed to reflect what the rest of the show was was about. And she just was just was so honored to be able to do it um, this couple of times. But I thought her her performance was was excellent. And, and, and you're right, you, you know, you would spend the whole the whole dinner outside if this was a meal you were really at. And so it's, just, it's like you, you're 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 jealous of the. <laughs> <laughs> right, good woman who gets to go to a quiet bedroom, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who who's oh man, why am I blanking right now? I should not refer to her as Britta from Community. Jillian oh, I, I think her name is Tiff in the show. Yeah, Tiff in the show. The actress's name is Jillian Jacobs. Jacobs. Um no, really, really good stuff. And then of course, so I was reading about the casting, and I mean, I guess people want to be in the show. Um, so it's not like they were, um, I guess they weren't, you know, spending huge dollars to get these people, people want to be in it. Um, and clearly they made something of a wager because presuming the bear continues, which I will be very angry if it does not, (laughs) um, I think at the very least, um, she and, 
um, Odenkirk's Uncle Lee will need to be in it more. Yeah. Well, almost particularly Odenkirk, but definitely also Tom. Right. I mean, so um, we don't, we actually don't know a ton about Odenkirk's character, really. Yeah, I saw it to him referred to as an on again, off again boyfriend of of Donna. So somehow loosely connected to the family. Obviously, back in this what we saw in this episode five years ago, Michael just despised him. Um, but there is also some kind of loose arrangement between now Carmi and Uncle Jimmy and Lee, where they're in some kind of business arrangement together with the restaurant. So he's gonna. I, I think you're right. I think you'd have to, yeah. to bring him back for something. Yeah, he he was mentioned. Before yep. we saw this, and Carmi said something like, "He's not my family." Yep, you know. Um, so there's real animosity there, and he definitely has to be in it more. And I think also, um, so too does Donna. If we 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 can jump around here because we're yep. talking about the whole thing. I mean, we see her again in the season finale, um, and we talked about this a little bit off air, but I found this really poignant. It seemed like you were maybe a little bit disappointed. But to remind uh, people what happens, she shows up, but then it's Pete who, who yeah. sees her and then he gets the scene. So, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, that, I mentioned this to you. And this was my only, I think, issue with, um, with with this scene and maybe even in the finale as a whole is that, you know, the whole first season, Pete is, is set up to be this, this sort of incompetent guy that nobody likes. Um, I think I use the word jabroni. You know, that's probably how the guys in Chicago think of him, right? And yeah, and uh, and then in the finale, he has to carry this emotional weight in this scene. It's like that's as much as I sort of like the interaction and thought it was important to the finale. Just thought maybe it would have been better if if they could have figured out a way for Natalie and, and her mom to do it. But you know, it's picking nits at, at that point. I just you know, we basically see Pete. I don't think at all this season. Um, right. So, and so then he so, comes up to this dinner and that's it. So then we'll give you the, the, uh, the counter position, I guess, because I thought this was kind of brilliant precisely because you have Pete characterized throughout season one as this is a bit of a doofus anyway. <laughs> you don't really want him around. He is in fishes, right? Where yeah. he very stupidly arrives with the tuna fish casserole, which is <laughs> going to wreck the fact that it's the feast of seven fishes. You brought eight fish, right? And 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 Natalie throws it out the door. Um, not clear, not entirely clear to me if they were married at that point already or if they were dating or what. Yeah, that's clarified. Um, but but so the fact that it is Pete, because I think that at the same time, he really is just like a really nice guy yeah he and he wants that's what he wants to be and it just you just still just kind of don't like him he just seems <laughs> like he's trying to ingratiate himself too much or something like this yeah. right so for him to have to carry that um emotional load and have to work through that scene i felt like all of a sudden when he actually was giving him a depth because i because i think it plays really effectively yeah and then it's, it wouldn't have worked for it to be natalie it wouldn't work for because sort of the whole point is that she showed up but couldn't go in and mm. is now making pete promise that he's not going to tell people that she was <laughs> ever there at all yeah and and the begging him to tell her that it's okay yeah you know, because because of course, because he's Pete, he's like he'll be fine. What are you talking about? Everything will be fine. Okay, come in. Well, yeah, yeah, and 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 um, yeah. I mean, I wonder when it goes back inside, and he starts crying and all of that. Um, I wondered if he was going to tell her, but I don't. He doesn't, but I also don't really think he will tell her. And I think that that, I th in my mind, it works for it to be Pete precisely because he's the kind of guy who doesn't really know how to handle this, you know, something like that. And I'm not that on the news. That that's that's a good point. I mean, it does track that Pete would be the one to ruin the news and and spoil the surprise about the baby, right? That that completely tracks with me. That something would slip out. It would be him. Would be the the one to do it. Um, but yeah, and 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 to hear you say that, maybe the the point is, 
we all maybe all the characters in the show need a little bit more of of Pete in them, right? They're all <laughs> psychos or just just you know so hyper focused on something and don't care about about others the way that they should what's Carmi's line that he says to Sydney you're going to have to care about everything more than you care about anything right and so it's just relates to how much they have to focus on this restaurant and Pete just wants everybody to be together he wants them to all be there you know in a in a sense and and you know we know from from episode six that a meal together doesn't really work but uh, he wants you there anyways to try to make it work yeah that's interesting because you got me thinking about how like really the problem with Pete is he is almost too normal um, for this group or something. He doesn't know how to navigate the ways in which they are neurotic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. 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 Very, very good point. Well, let, let's, so, I mean, obviously that, that six and was such a widely discussed and, and widely debated and, and surprise episode with all that, that happened there. And then it, yeah. it leads into what, you know, I thought, I think I wrote was ended up being my favorite episode of the of the series, which was episode seven, where yeah. Richie sort of has his purpose episode um, going and staging for uh, what they call the best restaurant in the world. Um, and just sort of curious for how that landed with you. I, I found it very emotional, very, very poignant and, and just hit me in all the right the right places with just sort of the course of what, 33 minutes. Yeah, I agree completely. And it definitely made me um, tear up. Teared up a lot over the course of the Bear Season 2, mm -hmm. honestly, for various reasons. And some of them were, you know, one of the things that stands out to me about this episode is that at least one of them was a moment of something close to joy or something. Yeah. Um, when, um, when he, I don't know the name of the manager or whatever the person is, the restaurant starts talking about how... Um, they're not going to let the couple pay for their dinner, mm -hmm. you know? So like, yeah, man, I thought this episode was, was great. I've always liked Richie, but the, the kind of character development he gets, and I have seen some people say maybe it's too fast or something like that, but I don't know what the point is that it, what Richie needed fundamentally was just a shift in his, perspective you know just to become the richie who wears suits now yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know that that suit is is i think emblematic of a a lot of things but it was necessary but also so well done that they gave you you, you could easily just sort of have richie evolve over the course of a season and give all these other folks sydney and marcus and tina you know all their departure episodes to um let them grow and just not give that to richie but but uh I, I just that growth just hit me i think the most and showed me I mean, that moment that you mentioned where he hears them say what they're going to do for those teachers and not give yeah. them the bill it's like that was the light bulb moment right yeah. and to be able to do that for someone while he may not be able to cook the thing and may not be able to plan the thing or fix the thing to be able to do that for someone he's got the skills the people skills, which that chef Terry confirms later, that that's um, that's what he can do for this place. Right. We've got another another cameo here with Olivia Coleman. Um, and that that scene, see now that that I would most directly compare to um the scene between Marcus and um what's his name, Luca in the show, Will Poulter's character? Yes, Will Poulter is Luca, yes. Yeah. Um, which is also I don't know how long it is, but several minutes, I think, of just this yeah. kind of quiet conversation about, um, I don't know, kind of hitting that every second counts sort of ethos in, in one way or another. I thought that was great. Which which one of those did, which one of those landed better for you? That's a fair question at all. You know, I, I think I probably, yeah, I, it certainly hit me harder with the uh, the Olivia Coleman Chef Terry um, co conversation. Mm -hmm. Just the um, what she talks about in her relationship with her with her father, what she talked about the relationship with the the industry that she was in, and how it beat her down so much. And then she was able to just say, "Why don't I just try, you know, again to to rise above this?" Um, but then also just 
all the while they're doing this very simple thing that she thinks will make a big impact, like peeling mushrooms, right? And for Richie to sort of just be, I think, overwhelmed with this information of what sort of a story can be while while also knowing you still have to pay attention to the details and pay attention to the things that, you know, will make these things great. Um, that just sort of the combination of those things, I, I think, is what hit me. And I think that those really hit Richie as well. Yeah, fair. No, and, and, and I think I agree. Um, and the peeling of the mushrooms, too, which is not really necessary. I mean, in terms of edibility. You don't have to you don't have to peel mushrooms nope. <laughs> <laughs> so but but the way that that kind of came together because that's one of the first things he asked her is why she's doing it you know um and that the point is almost intrinsic to the doing of it as just letting people know about the time that was put into it people will notice at least in a you know, subtle way if not consciously and then we, we never find out what um our father ended all of those journal entries exactly yeah. exactly and did you it, it sort of something that just popped in my head just just now sort of make any comparisons between or chef terry and then i don't know his name but the seemed like the the chef de cuisine just sort of the hard-ass jerk guy who shows up there when they're doing the staff meeting they're talking about the smudge he's the one who's you know pushing them to do all the things when they get the deep dish um just sort mm -hmm. of this real forceful guy compared to chef terry's demeanor and, and i think that you know richie saw both and the value of both but then also you know really i think latched on to the fact that chef terry what her personality was but also that she said that he had the right people skills and if she recognizes that in him that's sort of the direction that he wants to that he wants to go yeah well i mean i don't know that's interesting too though about the sponge because <laughs> No, I think it's kind of a key moment that Richie ultimately does get on board with that. Old Richie, who like when it was a big deal, even as he's starting as a stage, he's kind of like not doesn't see the point of making sure the forks are polished. Like they're clean, you can put it in your mouth. It's a fork, you know. Um, that's the name of the episode. But the way that the way that it all plays with the sponge, actually, I don't know because it's not what it very easily could be or feel like where you've got some particularly hard ass chef yelling in people's faces because they made some tiny mistake. It doesn't quite play like that. Yeah. He's yeah. disappointed that there's disappointment that no one's owning up to this and how that feeds into a worry about everyone being committed to the ideal of perfection you know and then like of course you are going there are going to be mistakes yeah right yeah. and but the best you could do is own up to that mistake and recommit yourself moving forward and and i feel like what what he's saying about the sponge and that this this gets in there for richie is that the worst thing you could do is pretend like it doesn't matter and not own up to it. yeah he, do, he does do a good job i think this chef and and I'm sorry I can't remember, I don't know if we ever hear his name um, in, in the show. Yeah, I'm not sure. He does a good job explaining to the staff what that one plate coming back to have to be clean does to the rest of the back of the house and the rest of the timing and the rest of the things that they're making. Just sort of the implications of yeah, you've got to care about these these details. And I do think that that as you said, Richie latches onto that in the context of we care about the details when we care about these people that are coming in with us. Right. And the then the last bit, which I think is genuine, you know, what I was trying to say before, it'd be very easy for it to come across as some kind of, um, you know, bullshit of like, well, the most important thing is that you own up to it. I think he actually means it, though. I think that they mean it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, good. Um, we want to talk about Claire. I'd love to. You wrote a really smart piece about about Claire. I'd love to talk about sort of that dynamic in the show. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Well, uh, people can go read what I wrote. When I'm curious, you know, for your impressions, also not just not just the one I wrote on it. That's fine. You know, um, it was kind of striking to me to see the number of people out there in the world who reacted negatively. You know, and really the biggest thing that uh, I wanted to react to was I was seeing people who were at least joking about fast forwarding through their scenes. I think that's a pretty big mistake. I mean, I don't know that it's quite on the level of 
watching The Sopranos and fast forwarding through the therapy scenes, but I would compare the moves. I, I, at least I think that Claire and what's going on with Claire is pretty central to the story. What do you think? Yeah, you know, we, we saw so much of the platonic relationship between Carmi and Sydney in the first season, and we see a lot of that still in the, the second season, although probably fewer scenes together. But I, I saw Claire as a really strong ad- addition, not just because I, I think she's a fantastic actress and it was a good performance, but also that it served as a point where Carmi has to understand, can I do both of these things? And be successful, or can I? Um, is it possible for me to divide my attention? And possible possible for me to um, be able to have this more smaller sense of a, a, a normal life? And I think she sort of served as the propellant for that um, in a really good way that probably Sydney could not have because they're both so psycho and hyper focused on making this this restaurant work. Yeah, I mean, I have to mention as an aside. I don't get the shipping between Carmi and Sid that apparently some people do. And I don't even <laughs> want to talk about it more than yeah, just acknowledge no. that I guess it exists. Uh, I, I think it's a platonic relationship and important that it is. It's a professional relationship. It's, it's a relationship as partners in a project. Um, but if we're if, to focus on Claire, I guess the other big thing I got thinking about is this is it's maybe a question because maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that the bear, the show, is setting up this kind of dichotomy like either you commit yourself to the restaurant mm-hmm. or you can, you know, have the love of your life or or whatever attended to your personal life. Because same goes with Marcus. But it's there where you could read it that way, right? Like with Marcus at the end, you see in the montage, we see that his phone is all lit up. He's missed calls from his mom's nurse. So it, it would be all too easy to read it as like, well, he chose the restaurant over being there with his mother, yeah. who's maybe dead now. Yeah. But I don't think that's what they're doing. And that's where I felt like trying to dig in on Claire um, was worth doing. Because I think if you if you look at their relationship, there's every indication that Maybe it could be possible, even though, of course, starting a restaurant's crazy and is going to take a lot of your time and a lot of your attention and needs to be prioritized. Um, I thought there was every indication that Claire would be okay with that, you know? Yeah. It, 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 and so, I'm um, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll let you get in there. You're starting to talk. No, I, I, that's, I think that's smart because I'm thinking back to, I think this was in episode five before they go to the party and they're sitting in the car after dropping off the liquor license and they talk about the similarities that her residency is gnarly and gross and 100 hours on and two hours off and she says oh well isn't opening a restaurant or running a restaurant the same way and so they both understand the devotion the commitment that the other one has to have so it's not like she would have unrealistic expectations of him to be able to do something that somebody else might might be able to. She she gets what it would what it would be like. So I, I I think that's 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 right on. Yeah. So I mean, then carrying forward from that, I mean, at least how I read it, I made this argument in the article that I, that I wrote is that the the, the, the con- that conflict is the very same one, but it, it it's in the show, but it's in the show in Carmi's head. Mm. Like that's his hang up. That's he, he's caught up on this, and that's why. Um, why basically I, I do think that when Richie calls him Donna, that he's not wrong about that. He's not wrong to make that comparison. I think it's maybe like the meanest thing he could possibly say. But what is he saying? You know, he's saying that Carmi is caught up in his own kind of mental neurotic drama and he's the one who's framing everything along these lines. And the biggest thing. One way or another, whatever you think of Claire, again, even if you don't like Claire as a character or her demeanor or whatever, um, I uh, one of the things I found myself thinking about the most when Carmi's locked in that meat freezer and all of that, or when he gets out, I mean, whenever you time this, he seems to f- totally fail to appreciate the fact that this staff that 
he has trained up actually pulled it off. That's it's interesting you say that because we when we leave the show at the end of season two, he doesn't know that he doesn't know what's happened. All he knows is he's had this conversation with Tina and he's had this argument with Richie and uh, Claire has popped in and heard him say things about you know how he doesn't deserve any amusement or enjoyment and it was all worthless and 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 not worth his not worth his time. He doesn't realize that he could step out and everybody else has had so much growth that they can accomplish this. So maybe that a possibility is there with him and him and Claire. I don't think he understands that there have been completely successful and it's over before he gets out of that thing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that would almost call for a careful rewatch. I mean, and then I, I don't know, we'd still get a definitive answer. That's interesting about, you know, the extent to which, um, what, what he doesn't know. Yeah. I guess I felt like Richie sort of told him, but that would be after he's mouthed out with Claire. Yeah. yeah so Richie comes there asking, what did you do to that girl? Um, uh -huh. And so, yeah, you're right. We're going to have to just yeah. go frame by frame here and see see what he knows and what he doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, it's, but I mean, it's also, I think there's going to be an ambiguity we can't resolve because there's also a question of how much can he hear through that door, yeah. how far, and so on and so forth. But, but yeah, I mean, um, it, so it could be, it's sort of, I think, tragic, even in the traditional, you know, technical sense of the term, either way, that um, what Carney encounters is this, I mean, he's probably lost Claire, as much as I want to believe that somehow <laughs> they can get it back. I mean, because it's technically possible, I was thinking about this last night. How I think it's 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 possible, you know, if he got out of there, if he went to Claire, if he apologized, if he wanted to reckon, it would work. Yeah. The problem is that man is not going to do that. Do you agree? I I with where we have left him, I agree with you. I, I think you know Claire forgave him pretty quickly for giving him giving her the wrong number. Um I suppose Carmi could use the excuse of I was literally locked in a place where I couldn't do anything on the night where they needed me the most. And so I lost my head and used that excuse. But I, I don't know, after he heard that voicemail, is he now someone that will go do that? I yeah, I don't know that I'm there yet. See, because, well, yeah, but see, here's the thing further, I think, because it wouldn't be what I'm imagining is not him trying to float this some kind of excuse or something like that. No. I think that if he went to her and was completely honest, mm -hmm. that could work out. But he's not going to do that. Yeah. Like in my predictions for the Bear season three, he's not going to call her. Richie's going to give him a hard time about why <laughs> isn't he talking to Claire? Right. Like maybe eventually yeah. by the end of season three, he talks to her again. Now, that's what I think is unfortunately. Yeah going to happen because at least for me their relationship really worked yeah I, I i think i agree with you i think that will be a um and that's that's i think that's that's probably right that richie comes into it or sees what was valuable about that and pushes him to to do it but carmy says oh maybe when we pay the money back or maybe when we're in a better place or we're more comfortable you know he, he just keeps pushing back on it knowing that he or feeling like he'll just ruin it again um but i, I can certainly see that being a part of season three which God, there better be a season three. We haven't got anything official yet, but I can't see what how they won't. Well, I do wonder about that. This risk is taking us on a tangent or back to our news segment. We followed some stuff about the writer's strike, but I mean, I don't know. Can a show even really get renewed in the middle of the writer's strike? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I, I suppose maybe maybe it technically could, but that's maybe, a good question. Maybe, uh, yeah, you think that... maybe it just won't because of that. Yeah, that they may just they may just be waiting. I think I went back and looked, and they announced a season two very quickly after season one came out and it got such such high praise. Uh, but you, you're probably right that they're just sort of waiting until some of the things officially happen before they before they announce it. Right, I mean, or they, need, they, they need writers to be able to do it. Well, yeah, and even if the simple have, um, you know, they want to talk to Christopher Sawyer, they like, hey, we want to give you a season three. Are you on board for season three? Yes. Okay, we're going to announce season and conversation not going to happen right now exactly um 
I don't know, but but I certainly, by all other metrics, I mean, I got an email from um, the FX press team about this being the um, like most highly watched FX on Hulu show ever. Yes, it's something like 75% higher view rate than when season one came out last year during, during the same week. I mean, it's just has absolutely yeah. exploded. So, I mean, I think whatever you, one never knows whether to trust uh, internally reported streaming data, but regardless, <laughs> they're saying that this is the case. I think everything points in the direction of it being yeah. renewed, um, you know, of uh, Jamie Lee Curtis winning an Emmy, you know, um, and so on and so forth. Probably, I mean, who's going to be up against for that Emmy? I don't know, sort of the guest guest spot Emmy. No, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> At least it's not Ray Sehorn. Give C. Yeah. Horner Emmy. This is the last <laughs> chance to the Emmys. Give that woman her Emmy. All right. Let, let me, let me, well, see, it, it, this whole timing thing throws me off too. But I, I think I read that Succession is putting Kieran Culkin up as lead this year. Yeah. So that could open the door for Yvonne Musbachrock to get one for supporting. So there's my plug right there. Give it to him. I don't really care. I, don't, they, <laughs> I, don't care. I care more about the awards we were talking about earlier than the Emmys. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're sidetracked. We'll talk about the Emmys when they come up, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, what else we got here in terms of uh, the latter half of the Bear season two? Yeah, I just, you know, I think the one thing. Um, so right now I'm on my third time watching it through and watching it through with my, with my wife now. And we're, I'm noticing how many times, you know, it says on the board, call the fridge guy, or someone says, are you going to call the fridge guy? Or, you know, they do something and it's not working or they make reference to it. And I just, I don't know, it threw me a tiny bit that for how, again, in his own words, psycho that Carmi is about details, that this is something that he would not do or not task to someone or not make sure that it is that it is done. And obviously this is a a the, <laughs> the focal point of what happens to him in the finale. Yeah. Would he have really forgotten to do that? I did think it was a little bit um, too um, what's the word that I want here? Lampshaded is that the word? Lamp post, <laughs> like, I, I choreographed, um, yeah, telegraphed, certainly telegraphed. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. that this is what was going to happen, and it did seem a little bit. We're talking about plausibility. There's the one scene where he's about to call the fridge guy, and then Claire calls him, and then he doesn't do either thing. <sighs> you know, I mean, I'm not going to say it's implausible because yeah. I guess I could see it playing out. You know, and no one else calls the fridge guy. He's insisted he will be the one to do it. You know, I, I don't think it's implausible, but it did kind of, I don't know. In terms of things that I didn't like, if I can put it that subjectively, <clears throat> that that scene in particular with the phone where he's about to call the fridge guy and and Claire calls him and doesn't answer the phone. And um, the um, the thing with Marcus's phone, where he's missed a bunch of messages and how they threw that in there. I didn't like either of those things. I mean, I could probably say more about why, I suppose, but what about you? Yeah, just on the, I agree with you on the, the Marcus's phone thing. I mean, obviously that's that's thrown in there to to... I don't know about solidify, but give more weight to the idea of, yeah, how do these people manage both of these things? But the the, the scene where Carmi doesn't answer his phone and doesn't end up pursuing either of those things or, you know, people that he's trying to to reach, it's almost like a pretty strong slap in the face of, look, we're showing you that this season is about these people have to make these choices, which one do they really care about? And he's choosing neither. So are both of them going to fail? And that's an, ends up what happening. And I, I just, I, I felt it a little bit too, um, too rough around that when that was not really what they were trying to do with it. That's what I think, right? It feels like it's, it's falling. Those moments are, are at risk of falling into the kind of cliched TV drama plot line that I think the season as a whole does such a good job 
of avoiding, complicating, viewing as, you know, just doing in a much, 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 much more nuanced way, it makes, it, it does kind of make it seem like, oh, Marcus chose the restaurant over his, de- his dying mother. Yeah. And I don't think that that's really what the show is trying to do. Um, yeah. So that's I, my, I, that's I don't think so either. There. And I just think it did a disservice to what they were trying to do. Not to take anything away. I thought this was an exceptional second season, the follow-up to the first. Yeah, I just didn't think that that was accomplished, maybe what they were trying to accomplish with it. Yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. So I think we've we've hit on most of the things on our list here. Anything um, yep. further you want to talk about there before we wrap? No, this I up? just I, I I mean I loved watching, writing, digesting this season. I, I mean, I, having now seen them now both seasons multiple times, it's really climbing up the ranks of my my favorite shows after just a couple of seasons. Um, I love what they've done to these characters. I love that they are real and that is telling an interesting human-based emotional story um it's just i I just found the second season to be exceptional and these last few things we've been talking about are really just just nitpicking what was really phenomenal yeah i agree perhaps i should just go re-watch it i i I felt and because i agree entirely about how good it is and i guess part of me has felt like i've I've gone to try to watch some other things and they just kind of (laughs) don't compare in quality yeah. we just even to say that they're bad i'm mean, just yeah i think this is really really exceptional um television here frankly in season two so you know well, if for any reason anyone listening to this hasn't watched the thing yet yeah take this as a long for <laughs> recommendation because it is the thing one thing i would say right about spoilers is at least in my mind i'm not really big on the term and part of it is I think when something is this good, you can't spoil it. And I don't like the term. Like mm. if someone listened to everything we just said, and they haven't seen the show yet. Yep. Yep. And then went and watched the show. That I, I fully believe they would still say, yeah, that was really good. You know, like you can know what happens. It's not quite the point. There's so much more going on. There's such great character work, you know. Yeah. And, that, and they tend to find that to be the case. Like with Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul was a prequel show. At some level, we knew what was going to happen the whole time. You know, like you knew Jimmy wasn't going to die. You know? So I will say, I'll use this this uh, analogy to say how much I agree with you. Uh, you. You know, because we've talked about it many times, that the biggest gap in my my TV watching history is that I have not seen Sopranos before. Right. I know probably beat for beat what happens in the finale because it's been discussed and deliberated and out there and, and for years now. And so, but I am, am in no way keeping that from when I finally do watch it, keep me from the enjoyment of this thing because, it, you know, so what? Yeah, I almost feel like that's an anti-spoiler, if I can coin a, coin a phrase, because the first time I watched the finale of The Sopranos, I was bewildered and kind of pissed, you know, yeah. and but when I rewatch The Sopranos and I know what's coming, now I watch, I watch it and say like, oh, you know, this is a good way to end it, mm. you know? As opposed to the first time, and I kind of presume people know vaguely we're talking about. You know, so like, is, did my cable go out? So, um, all right, well, well, man, I've, uh, I've enjoyed talking with uh, talking about the bear with you. This has been a really, really good show. We're just going to keep our ears to the ground and just hope that that uh, next season is announced as soon as they'll as they can. Yeah, indeed. So, okay, right. Well, I suppose we'll wrap up here. We'll meet up again. Um, next week or something like that uh please do follow the site on you know twitter if you say use twitter um, on facebook uh we are on we do have an instagram now um and you can find these things by searching tv obsessive uh again the website's tv obsessive uh, dot com um podcast is out there on spotify apple uh iheart audible i mean probably you know how'd you find this one uh there's also a tv obsessive youtube channel if you prefer to um listen to us with a rather boring video of sound waves um (laughs) there's some other stuff on there too please do go go to the youtube and, and like and subscribe um yeah, and like and subscribe to this uh, this podcast. We appreciate everybody listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. All right, see you next week, friend.